Welcome everybody to In Our Nature, an online event that dives into our broken bond with nature and how tech, science, art and design can act as repairing tools. My name is Lisa Chong, I'm the CEO of the Index Project, the non-profit organisation behind the pre prestigious Index Award, which our speaker today, Paola Antonelli, sits as a juror. This event is co-hosted and made in close collaboration with the Danish Society of Engineers and Art Hub Copenhagen. And we're so grateful to be live streaming from their offices in central Copenhagen. Today, we're jointly digital by people from all over the world and here in Copenhagen in a physical event. We have 50 guests representing the design, art, science and tech communities. Soon, Paola will take the virtual floor and speak on her work on today's subject. Later, we'll invite you to ask your questions from the audience in Copenhagen. And our online viewers will also be able to send questions. If you have any, please drop them in the Q&A and we'll go through as many as time allows. Now, I would like to introduce our design visionary, who I'm proud to work with at the Index Award. I admire, respect, and learn from so much of the work that she does. She's a force for good in the design and creative world. She is senior curator and director of R&D at MoMA in New York, creator of Broken Nature at the 22nd Triennale di Milano, co-founder and instigator of Design Emergency with fellow design behemoth, Alice Rawthorne, guest editor of the September edition of Wallpaper Magazine, which has now hit the bookstores. And I strongly urge you to go out, get your copy and get your hands on some of this amazing work that Paula and Alice have been working so hard on. So without further ado, I would like to welcome Paula all the way from New York. Hello, Paula. Hi, Lisa. It's so good to see you. It's been so long and it's so good to see Copenhagen. So thank you very much for inviting me to speak to you today. And also, I wanted to tell you, you don't even need to go and buy the copy of Wallpaper. You can download it for free if you want to. So it, we really, my behemoth friend and I really wanted it to go as far and wide as possible. But anyway, um, my, um, my heart is in Copenhagen and my heart is, is with Index, which is also a force for good. So I'm very, very, very pleased to be able to talk with you today about this great topic, which is in this really difficult moment for the world. I mean, it's always a difficult moment somewhere, but right now it's a difficult moment pretty much everywhere. What can art, technology, culture, design, architecture, what can they do? How can we have all hands on deck from, um, from all the different parts of our community? And uh, of course, Alice and I want to do our part. We have platforms, we have um, between quotes authority and we have reach. So we decided to join hands and do something that at the beginning was a work of love. You know, it was design emergency was a way to kind of highlight for the world the best examples of response uh, of design and architecture, sometimes accidental design responses to the pandemic. And then it blossomed into more of like a, a new platform for many other people to speak. But right now, what I would like to talk to you about is what happened before the pandemic and in particular, before this climate of emergency happened, what the emergencies were that design and architecture were trying to respond to and culture. And to do so, I would like to show you some of the work that Lisa mentioned in, and I'm gonna start sharing the screen. I would like to also show you a little bit of the Triennale. Now I'm gonna go there and it's the usual clumsy moment when you try to share um, the screen on 
Okay, it worked when you tried to share the screen, but it worked pretty smoothly, so that's great. So what you're looking at right now is the cover of the catalog of the 22nd Triennale di Milano that Lisa mentioned before. I am from Milan, um, and so it was particular, and I started my career at the Triennale building. You're design people, so I have, a, I have a feeling that you might have been there before, but it's a building that is in the heart of Milan. It's in the very center in the park, and it was built to host uh, periodic exhibitions, you know, showcases of architecture and design. And this is the 22nd showcase and I was invited to, to propose a theme and to do the exhibition. And what I did is I proposed this theme of broken nature, the idea that human beings, sometimes unaware of the fact that we are part of nature, have positioned themselves in a sort of antagonistic, uh, uh, antagonistic relationship with nature. And they have sometimes severed some of the ties that nature, uh, that connect us to nature. So the whole exhibition was about environmental responsibility, yes, but also social responsibility, all sorts of responsibilities that human beings need to have to live in the world with other human beings, with other species, and with the rest of the planet and possibly the universe. So you see here the cover of the catalog. I had a wonderful curatorial team that was composed of Ala Tanier, Laura Meran, Erika Petrillo, and then uh, there was a, a fabulous graphic designer, Anna Kulacek. And in this particular case, it's Elisa Pasquale and Marco Ferrari from Studio Folder that had taken care of the catalog. And they had chosen this amazing picture. It's a glacier in Switzerland that's been covered with fabric to try and prevent complete erosion. So it's the absurdity of us having to cover nature, cover necessarily, like, you know, really like put a blankie on nature in order to preserve it from the damage that we have uh, wrought upon it. So it, this paradox and this real craziness of our current predicament was at the basis of broken nature. And broken nature, you see here, um, tried to try to really invite citizens to do something about it. Whenever we do something, and you know you're in the audience, so some of you are designers, some of you are artists, we have different audiences in mind. You know, in, in some cases we talk to our fellow academics, in other cases we might talk to our investors. Um, as a curator, in a, a museum as far reaching as MoMA or as a citizen of Milan, what I wanted to do with my fellow curators was to speak to citizens. So we really wanted citizens to come to the exhibition and have a sense of the kind of actions and activism that they could have. So here in the center, you see the icons that Anna Kulacek, the graphic designer, had created to give a sense of the different, um, the different kind of like spaces that citizens can use in order to, to do some of their work. You know, like they can act on recycling, on interspecies design, they can act on social media in order to spread the word. So we really wanted to reach citizens. And we wanted you, you see here the entrance to the exhibition. We had three goals in mind. We wanted citizens that came to the show to leave with a sense of the length of time upon which changes happen, right? So we wanted to make sure that people did, went beyond the three or four generations um, perception that we're able to master as human beings and really felt the age of a glacier, the age of like trees, really had a sense of long time. That was the first goal. The second goal is we wanted to make sure that citizens would leave the exhibition having a sense of the fact that we live in systems, that every action does not have a reaction, but rather many reverberations. Therefore, what we do does not only have one effect for good and for bad. For instance, what we always use as an example, um, a few years ago, there was a tragedy in Bangladesh, in Dhaka, a factory fell all over all these sweat workers and more than 1300 were killed. And at that time, people were wondering as a word that I never use, consumers, I banned it from my, uh, from my vocabulary, but in that case it works. As consumers, what could people do? And some people stopped buying clothes made in Bangladesh, but that's the wrong reaction because it goes to only strengthen the problem. So understanding that we live in systems that in order to have an effect here, you might have to act here and then get 
to there is something that we really felt was important. And then another um, consequence that we wanted to have is we wanted all citizens to leave the Triennale having a sense of what they could do in their life to make a difference. And the whole Triennale was about this idea of restorative design. And that's exactly what the point was. We heard many different ways we thought of many different ways to tackle the problem of environmental crisis, you know, from, you know, mere sustainability, whatever that means anymore, to using less, to using better, to getting rid of single-use plastics. I mean, you name it, we can have a very, very long list. What we wanted to convey is that all these different strategies can come underneath an umbrella that switches the sense of being responsible from an idea of punishment to instead a new way of living with happiness and with purpose in the world. So restorative design means that design doesn't need to let go of formal elegance, doesn't need to let go of pleasure, doesn't need to let go of creativity in order to be responsible. Quite the opposite. Restorative design is a way to live better in a world that's complex and made of systems. So this was the entrance upstairs, and this was a sense of the exhibition inside. We were telling you, <clears throat> I was telling you how it was for citizens. And indeed, you see here uh, an example that caught many people's imagination. This is called Capsula Mundi, and it's a green burial system. The idea is that the corpse of the deceased person goes into this egg and a tree is planted on top. And uh, all of a sudden, the circularity and the cycle of nature is repeated. You might think, this is pretty corny. Yes, and in some cases, when you are uh, curating an exhibition, you need to modulate between really scientific and really steadfast and bare bone and instead a little bit of romanticism and a little bit of nuances. And I have to say that one of the aspects of the Triennale that made us happier um, is the as the curators is that many people found it moving. We believe that by moving emotionally people, you can also achieve a lot intellectually. And design is about changing behavior. So it was important for us to really make people understand that our new behavior is possible. One of the biggest aspects in the world of design and architecture right now is the work on materials. Materials that sometimes are uh, recycled, but in some cases are simply taken and harnessed from also the damages that we've made onto the world. You might know that there is a big pro proliferation of algae that are the byproduct of so much of the pollution that we have generated. And there are uh, places like Atelier Luma in Arles that try to actually make people understand how to use those seaweed and those algae to create new materials that then can be used to also remake vernacular products from that particular place. Anyway, you know, I have such little time that I want to condense it. These are some of the reparation strategies that we propose to people, you know, from reducing consumption to optimizing your own biome, from reducing waste to considering waste a new material, from reducing pollution to harnessing pollution, as you've seen in the algae, and then to be continued, but the last thing that you see there is increasing empathy. We do believe that design is about behaviors and design is about also trying to have a different attitude and a different relationship with other species and other human beings. This is a little bit of the ideas that we try to convey. In order to make people have a sense of the length of time, we used Images of Change, which is a um, an public domain website that you can go and visit that shows the before and after of different parts of the world, before or after both human-made and natural changes, before and after sometimes two days, other times, 2000 years. So it really is a way to show our uh, sense of time compared to the one on earth. Aura Streams by Forma Fantasma, you might have encountered it before, was an example of how electronic waste can become a new material. And I'm giving you here some examples so that you can bring down to earth 
this that I just told you, this idea of giving citizens new strategies and new ideas that they could then bring home. So all of this furniture, very beautiful, very Italian in the way it's like almost exasperatedly elegant, is all made with electronic waste. And this is also a denunciation of the kind of hidden underbelly of the e-waste in the world that is about exploitation and indentured labor in some cases. <clears throat> Another example of strict reparation is this 3D printed ceramic trellis that is now being deployed to rebuild the coral reef in Australia by Alex Goad, a young Australian engineer. And some of these objects have already been acquired by the MoMA collection and will be on display at MoMA. To speak about systems, this is a, a great example by Kate Crawford, who is an academic here at NYU. She studies ethics and arti artificial intelligence and Bladen Joller. This is the whole ecosystem of an Amazon Echo, both hardware and software, that tries to explain to people what is in the universe of an Echo in terms of trying to connect different parts, both hard and software. And one of the great um, stars of the exhibition was this little, um, this little octopus. And it was a, a project by Aki Nomata that showed how a little octopus of today can see the shell of her ancestors from thousands and years ago and immediately go into it with this call back to its, to its initial dwelling that's been shed over centuries by evolution. So showing that time exists, but at the same time can be compressed by instinct and by this kind of atavic calls that are sometimes revealed by architecture and design. But what made us particularly happy is what I told you, this idea of citizens really using the exhibition in the best way possible. And last year, the kids that were doing Fridays for the Future, that were striking from, the, from school on Fridays in order to make the world understand that the environmental crisis is real, would gather at the Triennale in our exhibition and begin all of their protests and all of their marches from there. So you see, that shows that an exhibition is really successful when you can have an impact that goes beyond the normal audience that goes to see art on museum walls. That's really what we want to achieve with our little work as curators. And you know, that's a little bit what we also try to do with the R&D department at MoMA. Lisa hinted at it, and uh, it's a department that we started, I would say at this point about eight years ago, that is all meant to show people and to prove to people that museums are not only places where you go and see art, but they are places where you go if you want to think of death, or if you want to think of what it means to be angry, or if you want to think of what it means to be dependent on drugs or on other people. And we have these salons in which you can find them all online, by the way, if you want, you can Google MoMA R&D and they are nicely edited so you don't have to watch the whole thing. But there are ways to show people that culture, art, design, this is not only about architecture and design, it's about all sorts of, uh, of visual arts, can help people deal with life. Every time we have at least four speakers, at least one of them is an artist and we give a reading list, and we just try to help people prepare their own critical tools in order to deal with life. So um, uh, the latest exhibition that we opened at MoMA, that opened just before the pandemic started and we had to close up, was on Neri Oxman, and it's entitled Material Ecology. It's relevant to speak about it today because it is once again about this idea of restorative design. It's once again about, again about proposing new ways to build and new ways to also build materials for the future of the world. Neri is um, a great architect that uh, works in, uh, uh, in New York, but also is a teacher, a professor at the MIT Media Lab. And we've, been, we've known each other for, at this point, 13 years. She's always worked on the intersection between nature and materials and buildings. And you know, organic design has evolved over the centuries from 
the idea of imitating nature because nature does it best to understanding the inner systems of nature all the way in Neri's work to working with nature in order to make things. So this is the exhibition that now just reopened. Thank thankfully, we were able to reopen the museum on August 27th so people can come, you know, with, the, with kind of a drop counter. We can allow about 100, 100 people an hour. And it's really quite amazing to see them come in and see the exhibition again. But uh, the exhibition shows how we can build with nature. This is a project that also was in the Triennale and it's Neri trying to build with melamin. Melanin, not melamin. Melamin is a resin. Melanin is the, um, is the actual pigment that is in not only humans but in pretty much in all of nature that regulates especially the way uh, it, beings encounter the sunlight. And in this case, um, you know, Neri was trying to think of what it could be to inject melanin in buildings, to make it so that buildings could protect themselves from the sun naturally instead of like building whole systems and infrastructures that exploit, that use energy and instead exploiting energy for that change to happen. But another really interesting byproduct of this strictly scientific experiment is also the emotional side, the kind of um, charged cultural value that melanin has acquired over the centuries to identify and to almost also classify different parts of the human race, of the human species. So um, you see here how all of organic design is exploited here. The scientific part, the understanding how to use nature in order to save energy and also the emotional side of it. So these are the encounters of, uh, uh, of science and culture and emotion that we crave the most in contemporary design and architecture. And this is one of the projects that I've always loved of Neri. The first time that she came up with this idea was in 2013. And the idea is very simple. How about building with nature? How about harnessing the constructive wisdom of nature to make things together, to make buildings that are therefore copacetic, that are therefore intrinsically organic, that are biodegradable, that are really in keeping with the laws of nature. And in 2013, she started working on a pavilion that merged robotics and computational architecture and nature that would be built by, in that case, 7,500 silkworms. It was quite an amazing feat. You know, it was about studying in detail how silkworms behave under certain conditions, spatial temperature, light conditions, and then preparing the turf for them to build a structure that was guided by the architect, but that was also spontaneously realized by the silkworms themselves. So it's about letting go of control, setting things up as in a system, but then letting go of control and seeing what happens. And it's almost like a controlled reaction that uh, expressed itself in this beautiful Bucky Fuller-like pavilion. The one that we have at MoMA is the second iteration. And you see here the MoMA galleries with the pavilion in it. Instead of giving the geometry to silkworms, in this particular case, we let 17,500 silkworms create a more spontaneous structure that was guided this time by a, a water soluble fabric on which there was a scaffold on which they would do their thing. So, it was even more of letting the um, silkworms not only be the construction workers, but also the architects, giving them a set of conditions that they could build in. And it's become, you see here, the new galleries at MoMA, and I hope that you will be able to come and see it. And if not, you can find on the MoMA website a sort of guided tour. The last exhibition that I wanted to mention to you because we're talking about restorative design is an exhibition that I did not work on. I mean, I wrote an essay in the catalog, but it's an exhibition that is closer to you, that is still open, and that you might want to go visit if you can. It's in London at the Serpentine Galleries, and it's by Forma Fantasma. 
Fulmer Fantasma is the same duo of designers that had done that e-waste examples, you know, in the exhibition. And um, it's, uh, this is an exhibition that is instead on the timber industry, on the timber industry worldwide. And uh, it's, uh, it talks in the same way about both the uh, possibility and the potential and also the dark underbelly of the wood industry. You see here some images of it. And it's realized with the same strategy. So it's about showing with great formal elegance some uh, not very pleasant and very inconvenient truths. And in this case, you know, Forma Fantasma I really like because they believe in the idea that formal elegance is a way to communicate more effectively. So once again, this idea of restorative design, it's not about self-punishment and self-flagellation. It's about using the best of our creativity and the best of formal elegance that we have been taught in order to make our uh, message clear and in order to reach even more individuals. So in this super condensed uh, presentation, what I wanted to convey to you was this need to be fully designers, to be fully architects, to be fully um, artists, but have a vector, a direction that steers us towards what we believe is a better direction for humanity. And at the beginning of the essay, <clears throat> in the Broken Nature catalog, I used a quote from Bucky Fuller that talked about trim tabs. You know, trim tabs are, um, are I'm sorry about the noise. <laughs> I apologize about the noise. So trim tabs are um, very small steering tabs and they all together, if many trim tabs switch, they can move gigantic ships. So it's really about this. I believe that common action and common activism can really help us find a new direction for humankind by using really what we have learned and becoming activists. And activism, once again, can be uh, immediate, can be explosive, or it can be quiet and over time. I think that design can really help us see this way of acting and this way of behaving. And I would like to discuss it with you right now. I'm open to questions and to, I know that Lisa and my colleagues at Index have prepared a good debate for me. So here I go. Paula, thank you so much. I mean, design is that restorative, was intense, huh? design is an that attitude, art is strategies for citizenship. Um, I, I mean, I think there's so much there and I, I, I urge uh, our audience here to, uh, to come up with their questions, but also you at home online, um, please um, send forward your questions for Paula, any burning questions that you would like Paula to, to dissect. So I'm going to give the opportunity to the floor here. Does anyone have a question that would like to pose to Paula after this fascinating and enlightening presentation? You. Hi, my name is Rasmus. Thank you for this, uh, for this talk. Um, my question is more, I would like you to elaborate on a statement you once made that I really liked where you said something in the line of, um, it's, not more, it's not a question anymore about whether humankind will go extinct. It's more a question of if we can go extinct in dignity. And this concept of deep time and the role of this, the designer and the architect and the and the artists, uh, can you maybe elaborate a bit on your thoughts about that? Thank you, Rasmus. Yeah, that was, um, that was one of the um, ways to present broken nature, you know, so everything dies, it's part of the cycle of nature. So it's obvious that we will become extinct. We don't have control over that fact. We have some control over the when, and we definitely have control over the how, you know, so make your extinction count. And I was always, I think that we can design an elegant extinction so that the next dominating species will remember us with respect and, and we will leave a good legacy. So <clears throat> it's not something that only designers can do, that only architects can do. It's about getting all together and just, you know, 
behaving better towards ourselves and towards the environment. And I believe that architects and designers um, can are very, are very good at creating teams. You know, collaboration is, is part of the way we behave. Artists, not necessarily, but some artists do. So it's their choice. Instead, architects and designers have to do it almost by definition. And I believe that architects and designers, from now on I'll say designers, because I believe that architecture is a part of design. So designers can really um, have a lot of influence in the future by being able to create consensus or at least create understanding. Consensus is overrated, but at least conversation, right? Um, just three days ago, Ruth Bader Ginsburg died, greatest um, judge in the Supreme Court. We all miss her tremendously for many different reasons. But what she taught many people is the importance of dissent. So dissent um, and uh, opposition and um, discussion are important. So architects and designers are very good at uh, dealing with dissent and very good at transforming dissent into creative force. So I believe that architects and designers can have a big role to play, no more architects, that designers have a big role to play uh, in order to convince and um, help people understand that we need to go towards um, a good extinction, an elegant one. Yes. Hi, Paola. My name is Irene. Thank you so much for your talk. One of the big questions right now in the world of design, of course, is how can we be truly inclusive, right? How can we be designing with, not for? And that's a question I want to ask. How can we be really grassroots about this, this initiatives and, and not be elitist? How can we really break down the barriers between the people who already consume this kind of content and the people who maybe haven't been as um, included yet? Thank you. Well, it's a, it's a gigantic question, Irene, and I, I completely agree with you. I think a lot is already happening and a lot, and I think the crisis, the pandemic will help. Uh, it's, um, I don't know how it is in Copenhagen. Here it's terrible. There's really a tabula rasa in New York, and my husband and I have stayed here during the pandemic, but so much has been zeroed. And um, all one can hope is to take advantage of this terrible situation to make this crisis count. I have a feeling that there might be a deep reconstruction or a deep rethinking also of the structures of, um, of design and, and architecture studios. And because I have a feeling that a lot of jobs or a lot of continuing retainer positions that existed before will, will be canceled, I think that designers will have a really much harder time paying their rent. There will be a lot of, of unemployment, which is terrible, but also the opportunity to create new forms uh, of activism. I don't know how they will be financed, but I'm hoping that that's going to be the direction and that these forms will be much more about considering the other 99% or 90% that have not been included before. So I'm hoping that designers will speak more, will reach out more, will become more activist, will also join NGOs and really flex their muscles in the absence of big corporate clients to try and improve the world. Now, it, this might be um, easier said than done, especially in the United States where, where there is zero public support for any creative job, but we'll see what happens. But to me, one of the biggest challenges, you know, human beings, even though they have been, some of them have been muzzled for centuries, they still speak. To me, the challenge is how do we design with other species that whose language we do not speak yet. So it's really, uh, you know, some, some said that this, this center is about communication and it's more and more so, but it's the kind of communication that is not the all caps BS of social media, but rather is about truly and trying to understand other uh, species, other races, other groups and designing together. Should we take one from Zoom? So Binet Vasa asks, is letting go of control also about challenging the designer's ego, which is about controlling the outcome of things? How do we make the shift from going from chaos to simplicity to accepting complexity as a process of the outcome? Uh, thank you. Uh, Neri's work is an example. 
you know, and um, other designers are working that way. I think David Benjamin, for instance, who is an architect here in New York, about setting some parameters and then letting things or animals do it, you know. So a lot of the work that Neri showed uh, is about that. She's been working with silkworms and then she's been working also with bacteria. And uh, right now she's starting with ants. David Benjamin, like many other designers, works with mushroom mycelium and then cornstalk or other. And in particular, he's working on this idea of biojamming, so being able to build things um, with fewer ingredients. So instead of using bricks and mortar, you use mycelium and the, um, and the different structures, the different bricks can actually become a solid wall by themselves without the addition of new materials. So it really is about studying um, the behaviors of nature beforehand with great depth and then setting parameters and hoping that things go the way you intended them to go. It's very hard for designers and uh, to let go of control completely, but they are trying. That's what I can tell you, <laughs> some of them. Paolo, what was so fascinating hearing you speak just now about the muzzling of, of um, other life forms where there is no language. I think this is something that's truly remarkable about 2020 is that we are living in an age of outrage and um, and us homo sapiens being able to just be outrageous at any given moment um it, it i mean maybe that's that's the development of, of of us as human beings and being able to to respond and respond so quickly through words and i think what was so fascinating hearing you speak in your talk about the letting go and letting nature guide us and direct us is that here we have a global pandemic that has really done that. I mean, this is, this is um, um, nature really fighting back and telling us uh, that maybe we have to rethink everything that we're doing. Um, so, I mean, it's, 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 it's the kind of the, the paradox of, of, of being humans, wanting to have the control, trying to maintain the power, um, yet nature will be the one that really will, will throw its muscles and, and, and really show its might, don't you think? Definitely, and it's not... Oh, I can hear the echo, okay. <laughs> yeah, okay, thank you. And it's not even fighting back, you know what I'm saying? It's not like nature is like, oh, punching back. It's like, yeah, here's the virus. You know, it's just reminding us how small we are. <laughs> You know, we can be big, but we're very small. And when you talked about outrage and muzzling, it's not even about muzzling other species. It's about muzzling other communities, other races, other classes. So there's a lot of hubris that we have that's going around. And um, this, uh, this pandemic should definitely be a big lesson um, that puts us back in perspective and makes us realize our place, I hope. Um, it's uh, one thing that is very important is that designers are very good at being big within their limits. So saying that we're small doesn't mean that we're insignificant. It just means that we, we work in a context that is much, much bigger than us. But within that context, we can do a lot and we can be satisfied with ourselves. We can be proud. We can do better. We can even exercise some control if we know that we're doing it and we use it almost like going to the gym. You know what I'm saying? So you, you can use control, just flex your muscles, but then let go at the right moment. So <clears throat> I think that um, this pandemic could be used well. Uh, if people are willing to accept limitations. Leslie, we have one more, yes? Several. Uh, we have one from Heidi. And Heidi asks, what do you think about this direction of materiality towards almost total degradation versus the human need to be remembered and leave trace for future generations? 
Well, there are many different ways to leave traces. You know, sometimes we look at, uh, we, we, sometimes, often we look in awe at some traces on earth that have been left by civilizations that have become extinct a long time ago. There are all those amazing Mayan and Aztec earth uh, sculptures that you can see only from above that were, was almost art for the gods or, you know, the um, Easter Island and uh, those very much endangered sculptures. So. There is, there are traces that we can leave that are material or immaterial, and not all, um, all, all new materials are about complete biodegradability. Sometimes it's about preserving them once we've made them for a longer time. So amongst the various strategies that we talked about in Broken Nature was also our gr grandmother's one. You know, if, if you have a coat, you have it for a lifetime and you leave it to your daughter and then to your, your niece. So it's not all about its appearance. It's about also preservation. It's just about being a little more responsible and mindful in what we do. So single use plastic was never put on earth to leave a good trace, right? It was just something completely functional that we have now realized is also really dangerous and uh and and bad very simply evil so we changed routes but there might have been some melamine this time i use the resin word on purpose by enzo mari that were made in the 1950s for danese that are gorgeous that we hope will never disappear you know so it's always about um, not being fanatical but being really mindful case by case of what we do We'll have a few more questions from online. Uh, the next one is from Anna, and she writes, hasn't nature always been in control, but we have just believed that we had it. And the pandemic has reminded us that we need to work with the constraints and use them as inspiration. Perhaps that's more of a comment than a question. Yeah, I agree. That's a, that's a good comment. <laughs> what would you say is the best area to complement the knowledge of an industrial designer so we can repair this broken bond? Is it biology or chemistry? Or anthropology, you know, it, they're all good areas in the sense that um, designers are, in, are enzymes, you know, they need to work with other substances always. So chemistry, biology, anthropology, sociology, political sciences, I mean, designs, uh, designs work sits in the middle of social life and uh, all these different disciplines and more come into play. So once again, designers are very good at knowing what they don't know and calling in the expertise that they need. So they have learned to work this way. Um, but you're touching on something, you're, not, you're making me think of something that is incredibly important. I would like to put it on the table for all of you today. Education, design education, that's a gigantic um, deal. It's really complex because so many schools of design right now cost a lot of money and make it so, especially once again in the United States where there's no support and all schools are private and uh, students come out of school with debts that are just disconcerting, they need to find a job immediately. And where do they find a job? It used to be in big corporations, now it's even worse. They uh, find jobs at places like big consulting companies like Boston Consulting. So it, it's even more complicated. There's a big danger and a big discrepancy between the idealism and experimentation that designers should pursue and the reality of the job market. And this is something it's not pretty, it's almost like plumbing, it's, it's, but it's something that we really should work on. Uh, and I'm the first one that doesn't apply herself enough to this issue because I'm, I teach, but I don't do enough. But uh, or organizations like Index or uh, institutions, government institutions should really help the world. I mean, it's a lost cause here, but especially in Europe, uh, help the design world recuperate this bubble of, uh, of vision that design schools used to be before all the budgets were cut and governments withdrew their help of the creative industries. I mean, I think that we're only going to see the tip of the iceberg when it comes to the resourcing of, of design education, but I think that's a, that's a subject that we probably have to take um, in phase two, Paola. Maybe we'll, we'll get prepared for that subject next time. 
Uh, we can take one from yeah. Victor. And he asks, with projects like Silk Pavilion, how do we pass the distinction between collaborating with the species versus bending them to produce according to human will? That is one of the biggest issues. I completely agree with you. So I have been, well, in the case of the Silk Pavilion, at least we know that the silkworms are treated better than in the silk industry, but is that enough? So they, you know, Neri and her collaborators have studied their behavior and basically they are convincing or um, directing the silkworms not to, not to create, um, not to spin, sorry, a cocoon, but rather to spin linearly. And then at the end, they create the same conditions of heat and comfort that the silkworm would have in the cocoon in order to transform into, uh, into a moth and then deposit new eggs. In the silk industry, once the cocoon is made, it gets boiled and the silkworm gets killed so that then the silk thread can be dissolved and used in the silk industry. But this, even though it's an explanation that might assuage and calm down animal activists still does not lead us to real equality because we don't know what silkworms want yet. And I've been working on the idea of interspecies design and I know I'm not the only one, also the Academy in Eindhoven, they have this new geo design course that is led by the two former phantasma designers. They're also working on it. When you say interspecies design, you don't know what you're saying. Right, because we have designed looking at animals, we have designed for animals, we have designed with animals, but a true collaboration and, uh, and relationship of like client or employer and, and client, et cetera, does not exist yet because we don't know how to communicate. So uh, it's, uh, it's a good question, Victor, because I'm still working on it and many are. I don't know how to answer it yet, but, an answer to that question is something that I'm looking forward to. I think we'll just take one more. It's actually from a past winner, uh, Dan Rosicard. He asks Paula, should we be scared or curious? Always curious and always scared. I believe, you know, fear and anger have become my companions in life. Um, I've always been scared of everything. And uh, by moving through the fear is, I have done some of my best things. This might be platitudes, but it's the truth. And anger is a, is a very strong engine to get things done, as all of you know, because you know, Lisa mentioned before outrage. Outrage is really powerful. So all of these, all of these feelings, emotions, um, states of mind that are considered negative can be turned into positives. I don't know if I can do it with hatred, but maybe. I'm, I'm, right now we're talking about only uh, fear in the case of Dan's question, and then I brought in also anger. Curiosity is the most important, um, I, I feel, quality or attitude that we can have as designers and as human beings in general. You know, just uh, curiosity is what can push us through all of these negative membranes that otherwise would block us. So embrace your fear, embrace your anger, and please try to be curious. I think that what happens during depression, which is almost the negation of being, is the biggest symptoms is the lack of curiosity. And to me, it's very similar to when, when one loses completely taste and all fact during the first phases of COVID. I think that that must be terrible. So this lack of stimuli and lack of motion towards the rest of the world is, is akin to death. So curiosity really matters. Uh, one last question. Yeah, there so are so many and they're so Thank good. Thank you so much for your talk and sharing your vision about the designer in current time. Huge inspiration. My question is, how do we check ourselves in the current research methods and of the examples you have shown to make sure that we don't inflict more harm with our new experimental techniques? How do we not make the same mistakes as we tread into new realms of making? Oh, good question. And thank you for your kind words. Hmm. I think that um, I can hear my echo. 
just <laughs> thank you. Um, I think that it's really important to keep the academic discourse going. I think that peer review, uh, citizen review would be a little complicated right now, especially if you want to really establish new protocols, which is what you're talking about, even though I love to go grassroots and to really ask people what they think. In this case, I think it might be more responsible to work within our smaller communities beforehand. So peer reviewing, peer talking, sharing, understanding um, what protocols can be enacted is very important. Um, I, even though I'm not an academic animal, I've never been really comfortable in academia. I really love communities, um, professional communities even. During the pandemic here in New York, uh, I was part of the crisis management team at MoMA, and we had set together a, a group of museums, like about 30 museums, and we established protocols together. It was really great to see how a protocol gets fine-tuned uh, amongst 30 different um, entities, right? And it gave me a taste of what academia, what good academia is when it's really good. Um, so that's probably what is needed. I know that there are many, if, we, if we're talking really about interspecies, there are many academic entities that have been working on biodesign for a while. The first was, was the University of Western Australia in Perth. That was one of the first locations. But right now, besides Eindhoven, I think that also the Alto University is doing a lot. I mean, there's, there's a lot of different schools that are working on this issue. And the beautiful thing is that, especially when you go to real campuses, you also have departments of ethics, right? So it's beautiful when you can take advantage of all of knowledge of academia um, and all of academia. So it's not only design, but it's also biology and then it's ethics. And then maybe there's also political sciences and somebody's talking about law. So all of a sudden you can check your, your uh, privilege as a human being with many other departments. And that's when academia really shows its beauty. And so that's what I'm hoping. Um, review inside our community and only when we're ready, we go out into the world. Says, hi, Paula. Do you think the focus on beauty and aesthetics in product design can also have an impact? They are usually sold as a luxurious products but have only the role of being beautiful. How do you think they can be more than that? Um, it's always complicated when we talk about beauty. You know, there's been ups and downs. You know, at some point, it was almost like a bad word to pronounce. And I've been trying to embrace it, but not as beauty per se, but as formal intention. So you can also use punk or use other unpretty ways to express form as a means of communication. Now, what you're talking about is pure styling and uh, that is a merchandising and marketing strategy. So from that viewpoint, you know, I, I don't want to, I don't want to poo poo it completely because, you know, Apple changed the way also the masses think of design and it was not all for bad. I mean, it, it elevated the threshold of people's acceptance of, uh, of formal beauty. And I always say that the opposite of beautiful is not ugly, but it's lazy, you know? So formal intention is good. But I, at the same time, would like consumerism to disappear. I would like people not to consume, but rather to use, adopt, um, integrate things in their life. So on the one hand, um, my, my kind of blabbery answer shows the complexity of your question, right? Because the absence of formal intention can be a form of laziness. Like just um, last week, I was preparing this, this conversation online that I had with Alice for MoMA about gender and design. And I had made this research about genderless design and had gone to all these cosmetics company that basically give you the saddest black and white tubes and say that that's genderless, right? So that to me is also something that is not okay. So um, styling is good when it shows real effort to get to people and to insert something meaningful in their lives. Yes, it is a merchandising um, strategy that sometimes just heightens the consumerist uh, crisis that we're living, but 
it's not worth denying formal beauty because ultimately it's a matter of respect uh, also towards other human beings. So all these different components tell you that this would be a great PhD <laughs> thesis if you want to undertake it because it's a very, very big issue. We seem to disregard our traditional knowledge of living and there seems to be a perception that anything traditional isn't good. How do we bring back tradition and blend it with the new technology? Oh, you know, I, I, don't, I don't think it's true. I disagree with you, quite the opposite. You know, just before we were talking about how in broken nature, some old habits from grandmothers could be super useful right now. Um, also, there is tremendous interest right now in indigenous cultures and crafts has become one of the biggest um, res reservoirs and of, of knowledge also for advanced materials. So I don't think so. I think if anything, there is a very healthy curiosity to go back to Dan, curiosity for tradition and for the wisdom that material cultures from all over the world, some of them millennia old, can bring to a world where we're trying to repair, where we're trying to restore, where we're trying to respect more. So um, I, can, I can tell you that I disagree with you and I'm so happy to be able to tell you that. Paola, on that note around curiosity, we, we, we take in and we draw in all the knowledge and the, uh, the inspiration that you've offered us today. I think what I hear anyway is that we need to be fine tuning that design attitude um, together with all the different disciplines that we have in the room. So the scientists, the technologists, the artists, the designers, and I would encourage everyone to continue that conversation. So as you say, designers are really good at instigating those conversations and we need to continue. And I think more importantly, create these conversations in order to have those strategies to shift behaviors because nothing's gonna happen unless we act. So on that note, Paola, I would love to thank you for your time. We would love to have you in person here, but I mean, virtually I know, works pretty well. I know. And I would <laughs> love you. to thank everyone who's joined us virtually. Thank you for your time and we hope wherever you are, whichever time zones. Um, follow us, send us more questions if you have any. We can send them on onward to Paolo if we have any more that we think of because it was a fantastic uh, dialogue that we've had today. Thank you everyone With in the great room pleasure. here for your afternoon. Copenhagen's sunny, it's shiny, and uh, we won't let the pandemic stop us. Well, thank you very much. Big, big hug. Ciao, Lisa. Ciao, everyone. Thank you.